My name is Melinda Brown Donovan, and I serve the STM as Associate Director of Continuing Education. Thank you for joining us this evening. Our special thanks also go out to our co-sponsor uh, for this event, the Boston College Center for Christian Jewish Learning, under the leadership of Father James Bernauer and Rabbi Ruth Langer. Thank you. Their literature and our literature is on the table near the entrance. In particular, I'd like to invite you to take a look at the STM's calendar of events. Um, we have two more that will be taking place this semester, uh, as well as two more big events in the summer. And these are on the, the very colorful brochure calendar that's located at the entrance. Now, Father Thomas Stegman uh, of the Society of Jesus will introduce our speaker. Father Stegman is Associate Professor of New Testament and Chair of the Ecclesiastical Faculty here at the School of Theology and Ministry. Father Stegman. Thank you, Melinda. It's my pleasure to introduce somebody to whom I was just introduced a few minutes ago, uh, Professor Adele Reinhartz. She holds an MA degree and PhD from McMaster University. Professor Reinhartz is, uh, teaches in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa in Canada. Professor Reinhartz is the general editor of the Journal of Biblical Literature, a most prestigious uh, first-rate journal and she was elected to the Royal Society of Canada in 2005. Currently, for the spring semester of 2014, she is visiting scholar at Harvard Divinity School. Professor Reinhardt's main areas of research are New Testament, early Jewish-Christian relations, the Bible and film, and feminist biblical criticism. She's the author of seven books, including Befriending the Beloved Disciple, a Jewish reading of the Gospel of John, published by Continuum, 2001. Scripture on the Silver Screen, published by Westminster John Knox in 2003. Jesus of Hollywood, published by Oxford University Press, 2007. And Bible and Cinema, an introduction, uh, recently published by Rutledge, uh, just last year. Her books have received some prestigious honors. She was the winner of the Canadian Jewish Book Award for Biblical Scholarship in the year 2000 and a finalist in the 2001 National Jewish Book Awards. In addition, Professor Reinhardt has edited or co-edited nine different volumes and has authored a long list of chapters in books and journal articles. Her current writing project is the Joanine Community, A Counter History which she expects to complete next year and will be published by Fortress Press. Professor Reinhardt has several distinguished honors to her credit. In 2003, she was awarded the prize for membership by the Society of Biblical Literature Committee on the Status of Women in the Profession. She was awarded the Bellagio Residency by the Rockefeller Foundation in 2004. And in 2005, she was named a fellow in the Royal Society of Canada the senior national body of distinguished Canadian scientists and scholars who are selected by their peers for outstanding contributions to the arts and sciences. So please join me in welcoming Professor Adele Reinhardt, who will speak to us this evening on the Gospel of John and the Parting of the Ways. Thank you very much, and it's truly a pleasure to be here. I feel very honored to have this opportunity to speak to you uh, about a part of my current book project, which is on uh, the Gospel of John, the Johannine community, and uh, the parting of the ways, referring to the process by which Judaism and Christianity became separate religions. But before we talk about the Gospel of John, we're going to talk about time travel. <laughs> And I'll confess that as a child, I was fascinated by the idea that one could go uh, back and forth in time. So mostly, uh, people like to go uh, forward in time. See, there's a machine there for going forward in time. And then, uh, <laughs> and this is a cute cartoon. Did you ever get that time machine to work? Don't you remember? I finished it next July. <laughs> um, so it kind of captures the fascination 
that I felt um, as, a, as a young person with times other than our own. But where some of my peers were uh, interested primarily in science fiction and in uh, imagining how the world would be at some point in the future, I was stuck in the past, and I have remained stuck in the past ever since. So as a child, you know, I would read The Little House on the Prairie. Um, I was very taken uh, with the Iliad and the Odyssey, and of course, Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments, which at least some people will be watching um, at some point in the next couple of weeks, uh, I imagine. As an adult, I kind of settled into uh, the first century, and I basically inhabit the first century much of the time, or some kind of imagined version uh, of it, and that's where I'm inviting you today. Now, as far as the first century goes, we have a few um, uh, things that can help us with our imagination. Uh, for example, we have various texts. So here we have uh, a nice picture of Philo uh, Judaeus, who is a... Um, Jewish philosopher who lived in Alexandria, kind of straddling the turn of the eras. And then here we have Josephus. This is Josephus. Uh, <laughs> a nice picture. Um, who is, was a um, historian, a Jewish historian in the first century. And it's thanks to Josephus that we have a fairly rich knowledge of Jewish history in the first century. Of course, uh, uh, you know, we have to uh, take what he says with a grain of salt here and there. But on the whole, we've learned a lot, and he's a, uh, one of our most important sources. So we have various written sources. Um, here I would include also the New Testament as a source for early Judaism, as well as for the prehistory of Christianity. But we also have material uh, remains. And here I just have um, a couple of examples. This is the synagogue at uh, Sardis in Turkey. Uh, it's later than the first century, but there aren't that many remains from the first century, so uh, we you know, use our imagination on, on what we've got. And here we have also just some Christian, uh, this is an, I think this is also from, uh, either from Sardis or from just outside of Ephesus. Um, so we've got archeological remains that allow us to uh, nourish our imagination, and we, we match that together or think about uh, those things together with the uh, literary uh, materials that we have in order to think about life in the first century. Now when we think about the first century and especially uh, the era uh, in which the New Testament was written, um, there are lots of questions. If we were time travelers, there are lots of questions that we would want to know the answers to. And here are, I just have chosen a few. Uh, for those of us that care about Jewish-Christian relations, this is one of the big ones. Who is actually responsible? Was it big bad Caiaphas, the high priest? Or was it Pontius Pilate, uh, whom we know of from other sources as not the nicest guy in the world, but comes across pretty nicely in the New Testament? So where do we actually apportion that? It would be really, really nice uh, to just... Um, uh, been a fly on the wall to see what happened there. Uh, another question that uh, might intrigue us as far as time travel goes has to do with the empty tomb. What really happened? Um, uh, we might say that this is a matter of faith and not uh, history, but when we're talking about the first century, it's really hard to distinguish very clearly between faith and, uh, and history. Uh, here is one of my personal favorites. Did Paul really fall off his horse? <laughs> I've been fascinated by the fact that the accounts and acts of the revelation to Paul talk about him kind of going along, approaching Damascus, and then this light from heaven, and it must have been a very dramatic event, and then and kind of this confrontation with uh, the risen Lord, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then he receives his mission. And I guess the idea that he fell off his horse comes from two points. First of all, he was going along. So how would he be going along? I mean, I can think of a number of different ways. But, uh, but then Jesus tells him, get up. <laughs> so that seems to imply that he had fallen down, perhaps out of, out of shock. And then painters and illustrators 
here's the horse running away. I don't think that's all that helpful, but um, you know, they, they tend to portray him as having fallen off his horse. And sometimes you just like to know um, whether that really happened. Now, the thing that I would really like to know uh, most of all is how did it come to be that Christianity turned into its own religion, its own set of institutions, and um, took on a kind of oppositional relationship to Judaism. And this is a, a question that arises because it didn't necessarily have to be that way. So we know that at the beginning, Jesus, his followers, the earliest communities, these were all Jews. So here we have Jesus being presented at the temple. Uh, well, here he is as a baby being presented at the temple. Here he's uh, kind of a preteen maybe heading towards his bar mitzvah, not really clear. Um, here, we know that he, uh, well, I think most scholars would agree that he was engaged in Jewish practice in the same way as other Jews around him. Uh, this is an illustration of the wedding at Cana story in John chapter two, which refers to the Jewish um, rite of uh, ritual hand washing before the meal. These are the jars for, <coughs> for hand washing. We have Jesus reading uh, something. This might be <coughs> scroll of Isaiah uh, in the synagogue. And here we have the Last Supper, one of the hundreds of renditions of the Last Supper, which is a Passover meal. And so you have some traditional foods on the table. So uh, it's pretty clear. I think there's no um, arguing that in the beginning, both Jesus and his followers, and this extended on into <clears throat> the church as it was developing after Jesus' death, were Jewish and they functioned within a Jewish framework. The evidence for, uh, the clear-cut evidence for separation uh, comes uh, later on in the fourth century and beyond. So here we have uh, Constantine <clears throat> around uh, 312, 315, an illustration of his revelation um, that is described as the occasion for his conversion to Christianity and that paved the way for the Christianization of the Roman Empire. Here from the similar period, perhaps a little bit later, we have a very interesting artifact. Uh, it's actually um, on a pillar in Asia Minor, in Laodicea. Um, and you see here that it, what is um, the scholars who uh, have written about this suggest that the the building was originally a synagogue, uh, and you see here the menorah and a shofar, a ram's horn. So these are traditional Jewish symbols. But above it, and to some extent over top of it, you have a cross. And so while you have, um, this symbolizes the taking over of Jewish sacred sites uh, for churches, and the kind of, not quite erasing, but superimposing Christian symbols on that. And then here we have um, images that are familiar to us of the uh, ecclesia and a synagogue, ecclesia triumphant, the church triumphant, and the synagogue um, kind of downtrodden and, uh, and defeated. And we find this image reproduced, uh, or this idea reproduced um, in many um, sculptures and uh, paintings and works of art. So we know that at some point, um, there was a tension that um, eventually resulted in uh, separation to the point that now we have two separate communities and um, to some extent we talk about churches and synagogues, Jewish community, uh, Christian community, Jewish community in opposition to each other. So the real question to me, if I had an opportunity to travel back through time, that's what I would want to know. Now, I'm not so sure that even if I could travel back that I would really know it because it was a very complex process. And just as now, we know in our own, you know, if we read the, the news or, uh, you know, watch the news on TV, we know that there are some processes that we don't fully understand. And we live in an age of, uh, of hyper uh, mediaization and perhaps all the more so than in the ancient world. Nevertheless, it would be uh, nice to know, but we don't. And in fact, over the years, uh, many models have arisen for understanding 
the or um, understanding the process or trying to explain the process by which the ways uh, parted. And I've just illustrated a few of them here. In the beginning, uh, at least when scholars started really talking about this, uh, uh, say in the 19th and 20th centuries, most common was the mother-daughter motif. So here you have you know, the mother-daughter uh, kind of symbolized there uh, with Judaism as the mother, Christianity as the daughter. This image has largely been abandoned because of um, the implication of supersessionism. So in a mother-daughter relationship, we know that there is a process in that relationship. Many of us experience that on one end or the other or, or both. Um, so the mother nurtures the daughter, fosters the daughter's growth and independence, but eventually the mother dies and the daughter it moves up in the in the generations. So that idea of replacement is problematic when we're talking about Judaism and Christianity. So that has largely been abandoned, I think, um, uh, because of the implication that Christianity replaced Judaism that's included in the metaphor of the model itself. Now some scholars still like the kinship model, but instead go for this, this is Jacob and Esau. I don't know which is Jacob and which is Esau, um, but <laughs> it'll work either way. Uh, and to refer to Judaism and Christianity uh, as siblings rather than uh, parent-child. Uh, this is nice because it implies, and I think which is historically uh, interesting as well, that rabbinic Judaism and Christianity basically grew up side by side and in interaction with each other, sometimes positive, sometimes uh, with conflict. Of course, there's still a whiff of supersessionism here because uh, who gets to play Jacob? Jacob is the one who wins out in the biblical story. Do we see that as um, Judaism? Well, from a Jewish perspective, um, you know, that, that is the case. Um, or do we see that as Christianity, which we might want to see if we were Christians of a certain sort? I don't know. So, um, so that's also a problematic uh, image. Then we have this, which is divorce. Okay, so here you have uh, communities that were getting along well together, that had cast their lot together, and then a rupture of relationship with all the pain that that would have involved. That's an interesting metaphor. But in general, people are leaving behind, scholars in general are leaving behind any of these kinship metaphors to look for other possibilities. And possibilities that, in, that don't carry with them the idea that one replaced the other. And so, um, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Danny uh, Boyarin, has suggested that, um, now I'm not sure if it's Christianity or Judaism, but maybe Christianity like a stone in a, uh, in a, uh, in a, you know, when you're skipping a stone and there are ripples that flow out from that, and that um, you have waves of movements and things happening uh, that you can't, um, that keep on changing their shape as time goes on. And that's a similar metaphor here. This is based on the work of the scholar Judith Liu, who suggests that we need to see the early relationships between Judaism and Christianity uh, more like the crisscrossing of muddy paths, that it wasn't so clear, let's say in the first century or the second century, where each path was going or that they would eventually lead off in very different directions. Or others have suggested that there really was no separation until much, much later. Instead, there was just a continuous highway going past different types of landscape. And as an individual, you could traverse um, uh, various areas of this in your lifetime. However, mostly, we talk about the parting of the ways. And when I hear the parting of the ways, I think of something like this. <laughs> a sign that I've already, I've been living here for about uh, two months and I've seen the sign uh, many times. <laughs> um, and so what it's implied by that is that initially there was one road, then veering off into two uh, different um, directions. 
and uh, ending up in two different destinations, Brighton or Logan. And if you end up at Logan, then if you're lucky, your plane takes off and you go someplace else. Um, so this is the dominant metaphor, is the parting of the ways. And um, I think this illustrates it quite well. Now here's another one, and this is where the Gospel of John comes in. So the Gospel of John, uh, over the years, has uh, provided quite a bit of material for those who want to think about um, the process by which Christianity uh, eventually separated from Judaism and became its own set of institutions. Um, <clears throat> for the last uh, 40 years or so, um, scholars have looked to the Gospel of John for a very specific point, and they have argued that in about 85 to 90 of the first century, there was a tremendous uh, conflict between uh, Johannine believers and the Jewish community among which they lived that uh, resulted in the Johannine believers being booted out of the synagogue, expelled from the synagogue, which is understood as an expulsion from the Jewish community as a whole. For some scholars, this is a model for the parting of the ways writ large in general. Others make more modest claims to argue that it really just pertained to this one community. And um, either way, there's an attempt to construct this from uh, the Gospel of John and to see its far-reaching implications as far as uh, Jewish-Christian relations are concerned. Now here are just a handful of books that, uh, look, I put mine in the middle, I didn't even realize that, <laughs> um, that relate to this. So the most important of these is this one, History and Theology in the Fourth Gospel. This is written by Lou Martin. Those of you who have studied some New Testament should be familiar with his name. Um, and Lou Martin is really the architect of this particular theory. This book, I would say, certainly is responsible for my own uh, decades-long interest in the Gospel of John, and for many others as well. It's a very, very powerful book. And in it, he constructs a whole narrative of the Johannine community that uh, really takes hold of the imagination. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, Martin's work was extended by Raymond Brown, another very, very important um, scholar of the Gospel of John and New Testament early Christianity in general. Uh, Brown basically accepted Martin's theory about, um, you know, that the, that the Johannine believers were kicked out of the synagogue uh, but he extends it to think also about uh, how the letters of John fit in and also what, how this might relate to the composition history of the gospel itself. And then um, the size of these only has to do with how good a picture I could find, <laughs> clear enough, I assure you. Um, and here we have three dissenters. So one of them is Richard Bauckham, um, who argues in his work that there was no Johannine community. In fact, there were no, uh, that the Gospels were not written for specific communities at all. They were written for the church as a whole. Um, I've written a long uh, critique of this view, but I'm finding that uh, there are some scholars who really uh, follow Bauckham on this, uh, especially scholars in, um, in the UK, which is where um, he has quite a few students. And then there is Robert Kaiser, the late Robert Kaiser, who in this book, Voyages with John, um, states that we simply shouldn't speculate about the early history of the Johannine community. Um, there's no information to go on and we just shouldn't do it. So I've disagreed with him as well. I agree that we don't have much information, but I also think, why shouldn't we do it? You know, we should speculate about it, but we should also be humble about any claims that we might make about the historicity of our speculations. And that's the approach that I've taken here in this book, Befriending the Beloved Disciple, which is really an attempt to think about the gospel from, a, from my perspective as, a, as an active participant in the Jewish community. 
And the book I'm writing now is really an attempt to imagine a different history, something different from the expulsion. We're going to talk about that um, in, a, in a moment. Now, how did Martin, uh, Lou Martin, come up with the expulsion theory? Well, the expulsion theory is based on three verses in the Gospel of John. And these three verses uh, are contain um, an unusual word that appears only here, uh, only in the Gospel of John and only in these three verses. Um, and it's translated roughly as being put out of the synagogue. So this is in the context of the story of the man born blind. You know, there's a man born blind. Jesus finds him, heals him. And then there's an interrogation by the Pharisees. And the Pharisees uh, ask his parents to testify about this, and they don't want to. I find this hard to believe because they would be Jewish parents, and I don't know any Jewish parents that would refuse to testify on behalf of their children. <laughs> but, you know, um, maybe I'm, uh, I'm uh, over-personalizing this. Anyway, why did his parents, so what they say is, ask him yourself, he is of age. So basically they're saying, let him take the flack for all of this. Um, and that's what I find shocking. But, uh, so his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. So this is really the most important verse that contributes to the expulsion theory. What, so L what Lou Martin said was that this verse is completely anachronistic to the time of Jesus. Of course, it's situated in the story about Jesus, but it can't have happened in the time of Jesus. So it can only reflect a later period towards the end of the first century when you already had a fairly well-developed, um, you know, sort of nascent uh, Christian community that could get into trouble with the Jewish community. Um, uh, so then he looked at this verse in conjunction with two others. This is in John chapter 12, which wraps up um, John's account of Jesus' ministry. Many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. So again, this a connection between fear and expulsion and a sense of, of threat and uh, danger that uh, pervades uh, really the latter half um, of the gospel. And then finally we have this verse that's in the farewell discourses where Jesus is telling his disciples, they will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, an hour is coming when those who kill you will think that by doing so, they are offering worship to, uh, to God. So from these verses, Martin suggested that we can um, construct the history of John's earliest readers, and that John's earliest readers were a group of Jews who believed Jesus to be the Messiah and who had experienced exclusion or expulsion from the synagogue on account of those beliefs. Now, Martin himself um, drew on a piece of external um, evidence to bolster his um, theory, and this is Birkat Haminim, um, which is a piece of, uh, it, that was inserted at some point uh, in antiquity uh, into the central Jewish prayer, the Amidah, or the 18 benedictions. And I've just highlighted, uh, this is one version of it. It comes in various uh, versions. For the apostates, let there be no hope, and let the arrogant government be speedily uprooted in our days. And here's a crucial piece. Let the Notsrim or Nazoraim or whoever they are and the Minim be destroyed in a moment. So the question is who are these Minim and Nazoraim or Notsrim? Uh, minim is the term usually translated uh, heretics. Notsrim is the term that became the word for Christians in general. It's still the word used now. Um, but it's not clear that it had that uh, broad a meaning in the ancient period. Now, when did this come about? So we have a rabbinic source that says, that attributes this to Shmuel HaKatan. Rabban Gamliel said to the sages, is there anyone who knows how to formulate a blessing against the heretics and the wicked? 
Shmuel HaKatan arose and formulated it. And this is situated within uh, the rabbinic uh, tractate, uh, the Talmudic tractate of Brachot, and it's situated in the late first century. So Martin took these bits and said, aha, uh -huh, this is how it happened. This was the mechanism for excluding um, Johannine believers from the synagogue. And so he argued that, um, because at that time, um, anybody could be a prayer leader. People would be called upon to be a prayer leader. And so the argument was um, that you could smoke out these secret Christians by asking them to be prayer leaders and seeing what happened when they got to, to, uh, to Birkat Aminim, to see whether they said it or not. Now, there are many arguments against this, and I'll just mention, as I always do in my lectures, you know, Ruth Langer, who's really um, the person whose views on this I follow and who's written, in my view, the definitive uh, book on the, on the history of this. First of all, uh, there is no evidence that this existed in the first century. Second of all, um, it's hard to imagine how it actually would have worked because there's a flaw in the reasoning um, who is a heretic? If I'm a Jewish believer in Christ, I'm not going to see myself as a heretic. So why would I be bothered if I'm going to be reciting this particular verse? And then there's a third element as well, because in Martin's theory, Martin's theory requires, or this part of his theory requires, the existence of a centralized Jewish authority that would make a decree that would go out through all the land and that, all, that would be adopted in all of the synagogues. But, you know, the Jewish community didn't function that way, and it still doesn't. Even today, where we have various organizations, you know, we have denominations, and denominations have their uber organizations, there is still the concept that a, each congregation and each rabbi has the authority within his or her congregation to make these kinds of decisions. And so you have a broader variety of practice um, than, um, than in other religious communities uh, because you don't really have like a pope or some kind of centralized authority that would uh, make uh, decisions on behalf of the community as a whole. So uh, others have uh, critiqued uh, Martin for this part of the, the thesis. He still holds by it. Um, but I would say in general, the expulsion theory is the uh, dominant um, theory. Now, um, I've critiqued this at length, and I'm not going to go into um, a, a lengthy uh, dismantling of the theory. I'll just uh, want to mention that the expulsion theory uh, depends on a two-level reading of the Gospel of John. And, and uh, Lou Martin and others articulate this um, explicitly. Uh, so there's the level of the story of Jesus, and then there's the level of the community. And what he does in his book, and this is why his book, History and Theology in the Fourth Gospel, is so powerful, he dramatizes the story of a man born blind in such a powerful way that you really can imagine yourself back uh, in that time and understand the strong feelings and the undercurrents of the emotions that would be fueling uh, the, uh, that kind of exchange in chapter 9. However, a two-level reading of the Gospel of John in a straightforward way is pretty problematic. I tried as an exercise um, to read the whole Gospel that way. I mean, what Martin does is he just reads certain passages that way. But he claims that the whole Gospel is really amenable to this kind of reading. But the fact is that it's not. If you would apply his method to the Gospel as a whole, you would end up with just a hodgepodge of different uh, models for Jewish-Christian relations, you, because you have Jews coming to comfort Laz uh, co uh, the sisters of Lazarus. Um, you have all kinds of other uh, possibilities if you start reading everything um, at two levels. And so it becomes problematic to apply this as a method to the gospel as a whole. The other reason that I've been suspicious of it is that it serves a very powerful homiletical purpose. I mean, one of the problems... Uh, with the Gospel of John um, is the many uh, hostile uh, expressions of hostility towards the Jews. And I was just told that this morning, um, within Catholic tradition, the reading was John 8, which is the classic example of this, John 8, 44. 
in which um, Jesus uh, refers to the Jews as a, where Jesus says to the Jews that they have the devil as their father. This is a source or the source for the persistent anti-Semitic imagery that connects Jews and the devil. You can find it today on the web, no problem. If you Google Jews and devil, you're going to find it all over the place. So it still packs a punch and it's still dangerous in my opinion. So what do you do with that? Especially if you're a part of a community uh, for whom the Gospel of John is sacred scripture, how do you reconcile such hostility with uh, your sense of this as sacred scripture? So the expulsion theory provides a way out by saying that the anti-Jewish expressions in the Gospel of John are an understandable response to the trauma of expulsion. As a Jew, I find that really problematic because it casts the blame back onto the Jews. Um, but in any case, I'm just telling you <laughs> that that's, that is one of my issues with the, um, with the expulsion theory. Now, one of the powerful things about Lou Martin's book, and it was probably the thing that got me into the study to begin with uh, many years ago, is that he urges us to take up residence in the Johannine community, to see with the eyes and to hear with the ears of the community. Of course, we can't really do that, but it's an act of the imagination to think ourselves back into that. And that's what he has done in his book. And that's what I'm trying to do in my book as well, but starting from a different uh, methodological perspective. I also would like to take up residence, not permanent residence, just, you know, for a bit. No green card, just, uh, you know, uh, whatever status I'm on now, B1 or something, B1 uh, visa. Um, to take up residence in the Jahannine community and to see it within its larger uh, context and to come up with something different than the expulsion hypothesis. So I'm going to just lay this out for you uh, a little bit uh, right now. And I'm going to start with archaeology. And the reason I'm doing that is because a week ago today, I was in Ephesus, Turkey. Um, and uh, as part of a kind of an archaeological trip uh, in uh, Western Turkey. This site here is the Basilica of St. John the Evangelist, which is just outside of the main uh, archaeological excavations in, uh, in Ephesus. And it is a sixth century um, big church built on the site associated with John the Evangelist's burial. So it reflects a long tradition, actually, that begins in the second century uh, that associates the Gospel of John with Ephesus. Whether this is really historical, I have no idea, to be honest with you. But it's as good as we've got. So we'll go with it, you know, without, without um, being willing to be burned at the stake, you know, to, to, to defend it. Uh, so at least what you have in the Basilica is evidence of a veneration of a site associated with the Gospel of John. And I guess um, that's going to have to do me for now. Throughout the rest of the site, however, um, of Ephesus, uh, there is a lot of uh, material for the imagination because the, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but it's a highly developed archaeological site. It's a large site, as it is, and the site uh, that we are able to visit is only 20% of the total size of the city. I mean, everywhere in Western Turkey, you start digging. It's like in Jerusalem, you start digging and you're going to find... Uh, Roman um, Byzanti and Byzantine uh, remains, Hellenistic remains, uh, and so on. So you can start to imagine, you know, John lived in a nice terraced house like this. These are the terraced homes, not terrorist, ter terraced uh, homes. And, you know, maybe he or his kids went to school. This is the gymnasium, only the boys would go. And uh, these are latrines adjacent to the gymnasium. I guess that makes sense. They had a communal, uh, this is how they did their business in the ancient uh, world, you know, no problem. Um, after school maybe, or, you know, he would have gone to the library. This is a beautiful library of Celsus. 
and um, this is really magnificent for those of us who like to spend a lot of time in libraries. You go in there, you see some magnificent structure. And uh, uh, in the second century or so when it was built, uh, they uh, mostly had scrolls still. And so there are niches in the wall. You know, so you roll up your scroll, I guess you tie it with a ribbon, and you, and you put it in the wall, and it, it had, I don't know, some 20,000 scrolls in it. The other thing that's really interesting about this that I found very intriguing was on one of these steps here, I think it's this one, there is a menorah incised in the step itself. And so that starts to give you, that opens up this whole um, image of how people from different ethnic communities would have mingled together. I mean, they would go to the library, they would go to the theater, uh, they would go um, to the marketplace, to the agora. So, um, you know, it's a, a very, uh, it's rich for the imagination. You can start to imagine a community there, a group of people. Um, there has been no um, church uncovered there as such from that period. Um, that shouldn't pose a problem for us since this is still the period when uh, house churches were very common. There's also not been a synagogue, but we know for sure that there were synagogues in Ephesus. We, th we uh, archeologically, none has been found uh, yet, but uh, we know that there were synagogues there. So it allows us to think a little bit about um, the hustle and bustle of an urban environment, which perhaps was the environment in which this community lived. Now, if we think back to uh, Martin's hypothesis, it implies that the Gospel of John is a window to some past experience. And in implying that, it also views the Gospel of John as a rather static um, object. It reflects the past. So part of what I'm trying to do is to uh, view the Gospel differently. Uh, instead of viewing it as uh, a window to the past, I am interested in um, how it might have functioned as a dynamic text trying to shape a future. Now, why might we think that it looks forward to a future? Well, it's the last few verses of chapter 20 that give us some hints as to that. So this is a story of Doubting Thomas. I think we're probably all uh, familiar with that story. Thomas wasn't around when the risen Lord came and showed himself to the disciples, and he didn't believe what the disciples told him. He said, I'm not gonna believe unless I uh, see the wounds, touch the wounds, and so on. So a week later, Jesus comes and he gives him this opportunity. And he says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. So many of the paintings, like here, show Thomas actually touching. But I, I find it interesting to note that in the verse itself, it doesn't say that. Jesus invites it, but we don't know whether Thomas actually took up that invitation. Um, <clears throat> but the punchline is this. So Thomas answers and he makes a, a full confession my Lord and my God, and then Jesus uh, kind of um, gives him a little slap, you know. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So who are those people that have not seen and yet believe? They're the people who are reading the gospel, either in our own day or at the end of the first century. So it's clear that the gospel has in mind a readership that is going to do something on the basis of the testimony that is um, in the gospel itself. And that's made explicit in the next couple of verses, which are usually seen as the statement of purpose and the conclusion for the gospel as a whole. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. So there's a self-consciousness about this as a, as a written text. But these are written so that you may believe, or may come to believe, there's a, there's a variant there, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. So the text, the book, is trying to work some magic on you as a reader, on any reader, so that you may believe. 
You may believe before, you may not believe before, but it's supposed to have an effect on you, some sort of transformative effect. Not just describe something that may have happened to your community, but to actually change something in you. And it's the plural that's used here. So I use this as my starting point. It's not just an individual that needs to, that needs to undergo some sort of transformation, but the community or the group as well. And I start from that uh, premise. <coughs> so the approach that I take, I refer to as a rhetorical approach. Um, and here's the definition. This is taken from George Kennedy's uh, really excellent book, uh, New Testament Interpretation Through Rhetorical Criticism. Rhetoric is that quality in discourse by which a speaker or writer seeks to accomplish his purposes. The writers of the books of the New Testament had a message to convey and sought to persuade an audience to believe it or to believe it more profoundly. I want to go further than that and say not just to believe it, but to take certain actions in their lives and to do things within their community that would express that uh, belief. Um, as such, they are rhetorical and their methods can be studied by the discipline of rhetoric. So that's George uh, Kennedy. Now, rhetoric, we use it in a contemporary sense. Um, it's persuade. Sometimes we use it negatively, right? Oh, that's just empty. We talk about empty rhetoric. But we, it, it's, a, it's a method within uh, literary studies <coughs> that looks at the different devices that a text uses to accomplish its purpose. So you can analyze, um, you know, if, uh, during a presidential election, for example, you can analyze the rhetoric of the candidates um, during debates and so on. But rhetoric is a very ancient discipline. And as Kennedy points out, <coughs> anybody living in a Greco-Roman environment in the first century, whether they had gone to um, a school, a gymnasium or not, would have internalized certain um, aspects of classical rhetoric through the work of Aristotle, either directly or indirectly, and other writers as well. And so um, it's legitimate to use this as a perspective, not just from a contemporary point of view, but also in terms of the ancient context of the gospel uh, writer. And that point is made by Clifton Black, who's also written uh, a very accessible and interesting um, introduction to the use of rhetorical criticism uh, for the uh, gospels. And he says, our only a priori point is undeniable. The New Testament's authors and readers lived in a culture whose speech and literature were suffused by techniques of persuasive discourse. And so I use this as a starting point for analyzing the Gospel of John for the persuasive discourse that it, that it uses and to think about what is, what is it trying to persuade us of, or these people that... Um, it was addressing. So I'm just going to summarize <coughs> my uh, conclusions. This is the scoop on, on, on the book. Um, so first of all, I'm assuming that whether in Ephesus or elsewhere, that the Gospel of John reflects an urban environment. And uh, I think that, of course, we don't know for sure. But there are a lot of crowd scenes in the Gospel, uh, a lot of situations where there are a lot of people present. Uh, that's certainly true in the first half of the gospel especially. <clears throat> it's only um, after the Last Supper that Jesus retreats alone with his disciples. Otherwise, they're always in the midst of a whole bunch of other people. And in the ancient world, that would happen primarily in a city, in, a, in an agora, in a theater, in a gymnasium, you know, in a, in a large public space. The other thing that I'm assuming here is that contrary to what uh, many of my colleagues think, I don't think that the Gospel of John, that the community that was the earliest readers of this Gospel were only Jews. I don't see this as only an inner Jewish conversation. Uh, there were Jews, of course, but there were also Samaritans, and there were also Gentiles, or pagans, whatever term we want to use for people who were practitioners of Greco-Roman uh, religiosity or spirituality. And we can draw that from the gospel itself. Of course, uh, they were Jews. We don't need to belabor that point. But chapter 4 makes it pretty clear that there were Samaritans that were believers and that are included uh, you know, in, in uh, the purview of the gospel. 
And then chapter 12 says explicitly that among those who went up to worship at the festival, this is a Jewish festival of Passover, were some Greeks. And there's a debate as to whether these are Greek-speaking Jews, so that would mean Jews from the diaspora, or whether they were actual um, you know, pagans. And I think the scholarly opinion is generally the latter, that they were probably pagans. They came to Philip, who was from uh, the Galilee, and said to him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. So that implies also, in my view, um, an, an openness at least to Gentile participation in the community and perhaps an indication that there were in fact Gentiles in the community. So <clears throat> what I'm going to argue in, in, uh, in this study is that the gospel is addressing a mixed community and trying to encourage them to see themselves as one, to become a single community and that that was really the challenge. Now, who are they going to be? Well, we don't really know who they're going to be. They don't call themselves Christians. The term Christian doesn't come into usage until later on in a widespread way for this community. <clears throat> but we do know for sure that they were not eudaioi. Eudaioi is the Greek word for the Jews. And um, if you, if you <clears throat> some of you maybe have done this in a, in a course or for your own interest, um, if you take the Greek um, of the Gospel of John and you count up the number of times that the term eudaioi is used, it's about 70 times, much more than all of the other texts put together. But what's really interesting is that except for one verse, neither Jesus nor his disciples are referred to as eudaioi, Jews. We know that they were Jews. So some people say, well, we know they were Jews. Why do you have to call them Jews? True, but everybody else was Jewish too. So why do you have to, call any, why do you have to use the term at all? <clears throat> so my argument is that through its terminology, the gospel writer is trying to dissociate Christ believers from the eudaioi. Um, the only place where you have eudaios used of Jesus is in the words of the Samaritan woman, who is not yet a believer, and she just says, um, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Uh, and this is in the context of um, the social, this in, in the social context where Jews and Samaritans didn't, um, didn't share vessels, <clears throat> so a Jew would not have asked a Samaritan. But we have many, many passages, and of course, yeah, so here's 844. Um, that really drive a wedge between Christ believers and the eudaioi. And so um, I'm playing with the idea that the primary identity of this group at this stage was, was a negative identity. They were not eudaioi. Now, what were they trying to achieve? There's lots of evidence <coughs> that the uh, gospel writer was concerned about the unity of the people of his particular group. And here I just have three examples. One is from the uh, story of the Good Shepherd, where um, Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. Many scholars see this as a reference to the Gentiles. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. So that's an image of unity. And then we have another image of the vine and the vine uh, grower and the branch. Um, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. So there's again language of uh, unity. And then finally we have the love commandment. Now love commandment in its own way is a controversial statement. It's been used uh, to suggest that the gospel writer had a universal concept of love for everybody. But if you read it in its context, it is spoken only to the disciples for them to love one another. So it's a love that exists between members of their group and does not extend to people outside. Uh, this is controversial, um, but um, I th that, that at least is how I, uh, I read it. Another candidate for um, sort of self-understanding. So they're, to be in unity, they're not to identify with the eudaioi. If we're looking for a positive term, 
uh, there are a couple that can be suggested. One is the way, and I put a question mark there because it's used in the Gospel of John several times. We don't know whether it's a kind of a technical term for the name of the group yet or not. Um, but we know from other texts, you know, and so we know in the Gospel of John, uh, as we have down here, uh, you know, this famous saying, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus provides the path to the Father. Um, but we know from other sources, especially from Acts, that this group was called the way. Um, and we know this from uh, some, we're not going to go over this in detail, but um, there were some who uh, refused to believe and spoke evil of the way before the congregation, and then uh, Paul uh, left. So it seems that in the earliest stages, at the time of the uh, preaching of Paul, we might suggest the term the way was used as a designation for uh, the beliefs and the community. But where I think the gospel writer is really going is with this expression here, children of God. And uh, that's because it crops up a number of times. Uh, first of all, in the prologue, when uh, the evangelist promises that all who receive him, who believe in his name, will have the power to become children of God, born not of blood or of the will or of the flesh or the will of man, um, but of God. And then we have it again in the story of, uh, in the um, conversation with Nicodemus, uh, this whole idea about being born again or being born from above. This word, you know, we talk about born again Christianity, it's based on this, on uh, chapter three, verse uh, <coughs> uh, on here, uh, chapter three in these early verses. Uh, but um, probably the verb or the adverb means from above and not again. But the effect is the same because it has to do with spiritual um, rebirth. And then we have what I think is the most intriguing passage, which is um, on the cross, uh, um, Jesus was already dead, so they didn't need to break his legs. The soldier pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. And there is no end of discussion as to what this water and blood uh, refer to. But um, having had several children myself, there's one situation where you have blood and water coming out, and it's, and it's childbirth. Um, so this fits in very well with the idea of rebirth being born from above. And in fact, you know, there, I think I didn't in the end include a slide of that. Oh yeah, I did. So you have in the art, uh, in art, um, this persistent image of sometimes it's angels, sometimes it's individuals who are catching the blood and water. And so the blood becomes associated with the Eucharist and the water with baptism. But it is an image of rebirth and rebirth through death. So it's quite powerful. It's a very powerful image, but it, it ties back into uh, this nomenclature of... Um, of um, being born again, becoming children of, uh, of God. Now the question is, did the uh, Gospel of John succeed in forging a unified community from all of these different people? Again, um, I just want to emphasize that this is my speculation, so when I talk about it, I'm not you know, really um, making uh, a, a hard and fast historical claim. This is my hypothesis. Did it succeed, hypothetically speaking? Well, we don't exactly know, but maybe for a period of time, because we have letters. We have three letters associated with that same group. And uh, the first letter in particular has language that draws on the sort of language that I've been talking about. <clears throat> if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who does right has been born of him. So this is, again, using the language of rebirth, but referring to Jesus as the one who gives birth uh, to, the, to this group, the children of God. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. Okay, again, you know, that I, I will use that to bolster my claim that this perhaps was a self-designation of the community. And then uh, further down as well, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been uh, revealed. So you have these references in the first letter. However, you also have a very clear 
um, statement of rupture within the community. So in contrast to the gospel, where I'm arguing against a two-level reading uh, that refers to expulsion, in a letter which it speaks about a specific situation, we, s we do see that there was a group of people who left the community and who basically tore the community apart. Um, and they're referred to as the Antichrist, and there's, again, a lot of debate as to um, how this happened and why this happened and what, you know, whether it was theologically based or based on something else. But for me, the important point is that, um, that the community seems not to have really succeeded in staying together for a very long time. And so at some point, the Gospel of John and the letters also began to circulate much more broadly in the Christian community and became accepted as canonical uh, within the Christian canon. So that's a brief uh, tour. We come back to the notion of uh, time travel and the historical imagination. And uh, that's me. And then this is the, this is a, you know, so these are the building blocks. These are the building blocks for what might be a different way of conceptualizing the community and therefore also uh, conceptualizing the relationship between this community and the Jewish community. Uh, because the upshot of my argument is that the Gospel of John doesn't reflect uh, an expulsion from the synagogue, but rather it's trying to create a separation. It's trying to create a group that will see itself as separate from, and perhaps to some extent over against, the eudaioi. Um, and these are, again, these are the building blocks. The gospel itself, Aristotelian uh, rhetoric, and um, the archaeological site that may or may not have pertained uh, to the gospel. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> <coughs> So I'm happy to take some questions, right? Sure. I would love to have some water. <laughs> Thank you. I think that there's somebody with a mic. And because this is being recorded, um, yes. But let's, let's uh, no, it's because of the uh, video recording that you need to speak into the mic. This may be an unusual question, but is it theorized whether <coughs> Jesus envisioned the creation of a new religion or just enhancing what was uh, his Jewish uh, upbringing by making it more inclusive? Okay, well, there are a few parts to that question. Um, uh, my own, first of all, you need to understand that uh, um, among scholars, you'll find a very broad range of views, and I'm just going to give you my view. Um, which is not my view alone. It's not only my view. Other people um, would agree with this. Um, that Jesus had no intention or no idea of starting a new religion. You don't really have a concept of religion as such in this era anyway. If you're Jewish, you live a certain lifestyle, you have a certain set of beliefs, you have a certain set of sacred texts. And there's no evidence at all, in my view, that Jesus was trying to do something different from that. Whether he was trying to enhance, I mean, that implies that Judaism needed some enhancing. I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's not language that I'm very comfortable with. But he took a stance within a Jewish framework, and he wasn't the only one to do so. Um, you have, uh, you know, the, uh, Second Temple Judaism was a dynamic um, entity composed of many different competing groups, all of whom had um, issues with each other, and thought that they were better than the others and that there were problems with the, other, with the other ways of doing things. And we know this from the Dead Sea community that left. Who knows what would have happened to them, you know, had they persisted through history. So I think Jesus was part of that general uh, kind of um, bubbling of uh, diversity and variety uh, within Second Temple Judaism. That's how I see it. Okay, there was another question. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. Do you think the fact that John's Gospel is very high Christology, where Jesus is considered divine, yeah. was one of the reasons why you know, the split took place? Um, well, in the Gospel of John, 
that is portrayed as the reason that the Jews didn't go for it. Now, how that relates to what happened historically is another matter. Because we have to remember that in the Gospel of John, and in any Gospel, it's the evangelist, whoever that actually was, who scripts everybody's language. So from the evangelist's perspective, the Jews' problem with Jesus was his claim to be son of God. Um, how that relates to history, probably that was part of, of the history of Jewish-Christian relations. But whether it was already a factor at this point is very difficult to say. I mean, the whole idea, and th this is really, um, you know, in order to answer these questions, um, you, uh, people operate from either an explicit or an implicit model of how these religions worked. And what I find is often the case is that uh, Christian scholars will, Im will superimpose their understanding of how Christianity worked onto the Jewish community. And so, for example, we know from the New Testament and from the Church Fathers that theology became very important. Christology, you know, that there were debates around all of this stuff and people were very passionate about that. What we don't know is whether that was also the case within Judaism. Was Judaism similarly theologically motivated? Well, I personally don't see it that way, although some people have argued that. Within a Jewish context, you know, how do you belong to a community? Um, and the letters of Paul really show this uh, clearly. You know, if, if you can't eat together or sleep together, in other words, if you're not keeping the dietary laws and not keeping the laws of circumcision, in effect, you're outside of the community. So um, I think this is a factor in the, the split, the inclusion of Gentiles as a result of the mission of Paul and many others who are preaching the same thing, who were able to sort of enter into a covenant community without engaging in the identity markers of the Jewish community, and then they had to be out. They couldn't be part of the same community anymore. As I said, once you can't marry, sleep together, once you can't eat together, what, what is it that constitutes you as a community? So, um, you know, whether the high Christology was an important factor in the split, I honestly don't know. I would vote against it if I had to, but honestly, I don't know. Okay, there's a question over here. Yeah. <coughs> the, the idea from rhetorical criticism that you shared with us about life in his name will appeal to many people in my church of various views from the Nazarene-inspired people to the liberal other end, which would be me. And I am about to be asked by our pastor which, at First Congregational in Rockport to lead a Bible study group. So what I'm wondering is, do you see any hope for rhetorical criticism being a bridge between almost fundamentalist Christians and more liberal Christians? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I mean, we have to choose how we talk about the text. And I choose rhetorical criticism as a way of thinking about, uh, as, as a kind of foundation for the questions that I'm asking of the text. So I don't find it so helpful to think, okay, what in history is the text reflecting? I'm much more interested, because it's more fun maybe, to, to think about what is the text trying to achieve? And so that's why I gravitate towards rhetorical criticism. So how that would work, you know, but I think that you know, Christians who are readers of the text from a faith perspective are the ones who can recognize the rhetorical techniques, but they're also allowing themselves to enter into that. I'm an outsider to that community, so when I'm reading these, when I'm reading this gospel, I'm very aware that it's not talking to me, or at least I'm not listening to it in that way. And so I'm interested in how those first century people heard it. Um, it would take somebody else to, to think about whether this is a, um, um, you, you're probably better equipped than I am to think about whether this could bridge among different groups of, um, 
of Christians who are maybe experiencing t some tension among themselves. I don't really know. Yeah, Charlie? <coughs> uh, Adele, I'm wondering if um, we can learn anything about the position of John from the interaction of other Christians uh, within the Jewish world in the first century. I'm thinking particularly of James, but of any others that might, m that might shed some light on, on John. It's hard to know. I mean, we don't really know who John is. Uh, I mean, the Gospels, um, I'm sure that, that you all know this, but we refer to the Gospels as, you know, the evangelists as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but those are late associations. From a historical perspective, we don't actually know who, who wrote them. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know, um, you know, whether that's helpful or not. I've been... Uh, I find myself, in reading John, often thinking about Paul. If, it, if we can argue that John is in part addressing a pagan audience or people who came from that background, then we can also think about Paul as someone who's Jewish but was addressing that audience. And perhaps to imagine that the issues that Paul raises in his letters would have been issues for any Gentile participants in, in an early community, issues around circumcision, dietary laws, and, and so on. I don't know, you know, I have to think about whether this community that I'm imagining kept the dietary laws or not, or circumcision. Uh, I honestly don't know. I would imagine that they didn't keep circumcision. Um, I don't know about the dietary laws. I think I can speculate and argue from the gospel that they read Torah and perhaps read the Gospel of John as a sacred text, prophetic writing, or, or something. Um, so it's hard to know. But the person that I find <coughs> who, co who comes to my mind most often as I'm working through this is, is in fact Paul, who was going around creating communities. And uh, so the letters provide a little bit of insight into how that process might have worked. And uh, the other question that we don't know is how big was this Johannine community? You know, was it w like one of these mega churches that we see around now? Or was it like five people? We don't really know. We have no idea. And, um, you know, Bauckham, Richard Bauckham, who I mentioned earlier, who wants to argue that the gospel, was, the gospel of John and the other gospels were written for the church as a whole, um, you know, one of his arguments is that uh, the gospels are not letters, um, and if you're writing something down, you're writing it not for the people that you're interacting with. And I just don't buy that argument. If you think about the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, the scrolls that were found at Qumran that scholars believe were written for that community, well, they're right there. You know, that's the community they were written for, and that's the people who wrote them. So um, we write things down for each other all the time. Uh, documents. I mean, in, at a university, those of us that work in a university environment, we're always sending documents around to each other. Well, we could just talk to each other, it's true. But there's something about writing things down that changes the dynamic of how you interact with that information. So, anyway, I just want to point that out. <coughs> and let's wait for the, for the mic. <coughs> Thanks. It was an interesting presentation. At what point does... Um, Judaism or the Judaism that's going to evolve into rabbinic Judaism, uh, does, does it ever become aware of the Christian scriptures and start yeah. commenting or interpreting them and arguing against them? Um, well, you have, <coughs> yes. Um, you have a lot of evidence in rabbinic literature of a polemic against Christianity. Uh, there are stories about uh, kind of disparaging stories about Jesus and his <coughs> parentage, who his mother really was, you know, a hairdresser or, you know, uh, who his father really was, a Roman soldier, one night stand uh, type of thing. Uh, <coughs> so you have those kinds of disparaging comments. And then um, there's been a lot of work done recently um, sort of thinking about the possibility that rabbinic Judaism in some of its aspects was actually shaped in opposition to Christianity. And that Judaism and Christianity 
first of all, we do know that the rabbis and the church fathers, at least some of them, interacted with each other. Um, and so they knew each other and they had opportunity to talk to each other. Um, but uh, some scholars are arguing now that more than we think was actually formulated in opposition to Christianity, in reaction to Christianity. So yes, um, <coughs> I don't know that we have any evidence of that before the Talmud. Um, it's sort of something very concrete, but certainly then by the fifth, sixth century, you've got, you've got um, which is of course after Constantine's conversion and after Christianity became a, you know, a dominant power. There shouldn't be too many more questions because I will not be able to answer them soon, but uh, <coughs> there are a couple more here that I'll take a crack at. I don't know whether this, this one? I don't know whether this <coughs> question interests you or not, uh, but if we start from the point that the gospel was written in order to persuade, and the point to persuade is to follow the way or to follow Christ as right. the new uh, one who has the truth. You started to talk a little bit about the washing of the feet yeah. and what was Christ saying at that point, I think. Would you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think you were wrapping it around the idea of unity and whether or not right. there is a unity that he is uh, advocating and a, a kind of love there that is right. universal or is it directed only at the disciples? And I tended to think that in that passage there are actually two points. There's one when he's actually washing the feet and then there's the lesson that comes after that right. where he's talking again about washing the feet of others. So could right. you talk a little bit Well, more? I'll give you my, my view that in its original context, it really was an inner, an in-group thing. Um, and we know that because only the disciples are present. Whereas in the earlier part of the gospel, he's speaking to the crowds. He doesn't preach the message of love when he's speaking to the crowds. It only begins at the Last Supper. However, I don't see a problem with the reinterpretation of the love commandment into a more universal aspect. So I'm not trying to make, in, in saying that this was just among the disciples or just among the community, I'm not making a blanket statement about the value of love and universalism and so on within Christianity as such. I'm, j I'm, I'm making a kind of historical statement um, about simply what the intention was, I believe, in the gospel itself. So I can't really get past that from a historical point of view, but as I say, you know, I think that there's a legitimacy, and uh, certainly within a Jewish context, we do this all the time. We take, we extract what we need for our present day situation and what is helpful in our present day situation and set aside the historical concerns at various points. And I think from a point of view of how a community lives together and how a, a religious group kind of understands itself in the world, that's a legitimate activity. So if there are groups that universalize this notion of love and that see that as part of their way of being in the world, um, you know, I respect that. <coughs> I think these will be the last ones because I really won't be able to uh, continue. <coughs> I just I I wanted you to expand a little bit on the idea that, uh, as you said, uh, the Jewish community did not ex uh, accept Jesus as the Son of God. How, um, like, this, are they still waiting for this Messiah to come? You're talking about now or then? Now. Oh, now? Well, first of all, in the ancient world, um, many of the early believers in Jesus were Jewish. So it's not true that there were no Jews who didn't go for it, just a Jewish establishment, I mean, on the whole. Um, I would say that there are Jews who now continue to expect a Messiah, and it's built into traditional liturgy, for example. Um, how literally uh, people take that will really depend on on who they are, and there's a broad range of views on this. There's a group within uh, Israel that is preparing for the rebuilding of the temple. And they're, they're creating the objects that will be needed. There are others, like me, that the idea of the rebuilding of the temple, forget all the political 
chaos that that would create. But just think about the sacrifices. Do we really want to reinstitute the sacrificial cult? Really? You know, I can't imagine it. And, um, you know, so it's in the liturgy that, you know, when I go to synagogue, it's there and I say these words, but I interpret them, of course, in a different way. So, yes, in general, there is a uh, messianic expectation. How specific that is and how committed people are to that really varies. How central that is to people's construction of their Jewish identity, I say for many people it's not really central at this point in time. But for some it is. <clears throat> Thank you.